here at the museum in our library, uh, in the past there have been different researchers who've put together lists of place names in Madison County. Uh, and so we, I kind of went through and put all those lists together and came up with roughly 110 names in our history of places in Madison County. Places can be towns, places can be cities, places can be villages, places can be crossroads uh, where you just blink your eye and you're past it. Uh, places can be neighborhoods, uh, places can be lots of different things. As I got more into that and really started to get serious about hunting those names, began to uncover through old documents and so forth, lots of different names that added to that list. And when I got all done, I had 143 names in Madison County. Well, then I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun if I could figure out where those places were, why they got the name that they got, and um, so then I, so that put me on a journey. Got in the car, and I began to visit all 14 of our townships and nail down where all of these places were. Along the way in each township, I began to take photographs of some of the beautiful sites that are in Madison County. Now, you know, you can go out west and see the Grand Canyon and you can go to the Great Smoky Mountains and you see beautiful scenery. But I'm telling you, we here in Madison County have some very, very beautiful scenery if you just seek it out, get off on the by road, so to speak. And that's what I did in this project. Uh, had a lot of fun doing it, and I learned a lot. I learned an awful lot. I learned one thing, and that is that no matter how much I thought I knew, there's a whole lot more I don't know. And it's still that way. With the river book that I wrote, I grew up with the river, and I knew those stories, and it was easy for me to just sit at home and put those down on paper. But when it came to this project, I found out how little I knew and what I had to do to get out and seek out that information. Well, as I was doing that, I always had my camera with me, taking pictures and so forth, and all of a sudden it, it dawned on me, you know, it might be a good idea to put this in some kind of PowerPoint presentation where the other people could enjoy the story of Madison County as told by townships. And so I began to, to do that. So that's the evolution of the process that uh, brings us to uh, tonight. What's in a name is what I call all of this. I ended up doing all the townships plus the county. So there are 14 civil townships in Madison County, plus the county makes 15 of these programs. I'm hoping that the Historical Society will be kind enough to let me do all 15 of them in preparation for our bicentennial celebration. You may not realize it, but this is 2019, and in 2023, just a few short years away, our county will be 200 years old. And so this is all in preparation, I guess, to prepare our citizens to better enjoy and better appreciate our history. Having said all that, let's take a look at Fall Creek Township. It's the third largest township in our county. Only Monroe and Pipe Creek are larger. It's six miles east to west and seven miles north to south making it, in total, 42 square miles. The township derived its name from the principal waterway, Fall Creek. It flows in a general southwesterly direction, traversing the width of the township for a distance of roughly eight miles. Fall Creek is one of the original five townships created by the county board between 1823 and 1829, and like the other four, the actual date of formation Formal organization is unknown. Reason being, we had a fire in our courthouse in 1880, and those organizational records for those first five townships being Fall Creek, 
Adams, Green, Anderson, and Jackson, those five townships, we don't know the date of their organization. However, I do know I found documentation in 1829 where it states that those five were already formed by 1829. This is a plat map of Fall Creek Township. The arrow uh, shows you Fall Creek as it enters the township coming out of Adams Township and makes its way south where it exits into Green Township. No doubt the area known to many as the Falls because of where the creek takes a nine foot plunge over solid rock had been visited many times prior to settlement by white men seeking game for food or fur. The town board of Pendleton has done an outstanding job. Throughout the community are these brand new historical markers. They're everywhere. The verbiage on them is perfect. Whoever composed them did an outstanding job, in my opinion, of presenting facts. They're placed at appropriate places throughout the town of Pendleton. And I will show you some of those as we go through uh, this presentation. Uh, I'll not bother to read them to you. That's the backside of this particular <coughs> one, located right in Falls Park. And some scenes that I have taken uh, at the falls. It's a pretty tame falls now, but if you can see some of the early photographs of this thing, it was a roaring cataract. With, it appears to be about a nine foot plunge that has been uh, reduced considerably. Some of my earliest memories of my childhood in Madison County were spent swimming there. Any of you ever swim in that place? Oh, wow. Don't have to tell you anything. Wasn't it fun walking around in that thing? You remember the sharp rocks that... Uh... Yeah. Now, if you got down near the dam, there was a little sand down there, and it wasn't so bad. And, of course, if you got on the dam, it was covered with moss, and then you might slip and bust your head open. But it was a, it was a fun place to swim. The old diving board. John Rogers. But the credit of being the first settler in what became Fall Creek Township, or for that matter, anywhere in our county, goes to a tall, raw-boned Irishman named John Rogers. He arrived in the area from North Carolina, December the 29th, 1818, and settled on a tract of land about a mile and a half east of today's town of Pendleton on the south side of State Road 38. What's today's date? January 28th, 2019. 200 years ago and one month, John Rogers arrives here. 200 years ago and one month. Although hard to imagine today that he would have undertaken the journey at that time of the year when weather would have been exasperated, already poor, difficult travel conditions, his arrival was found recorded in a book in Mr. Rogers' own handwriting, substantiating his date of arrival. The lands had not yet been surveyed, but when he went about clearing his land, preparing for a crop the following spring, shortly afterwards, the United States survey was made of his land revealing the actual property boundaries. Realizing that he did not like part of the ground on which he had settled, he moved a few hundred yards to the southeast where he recorded a farm on which he lived until 1838 when he sold his land to Abraham Vernon and John Rogers moved on to Iowa. The site of John Rogers' 1818 property is this location right here where the silo is located on State Road 38. That is his first tract of land. According to a very good friend of mine, Jay Brown, in an interview that I conducted of him with him on September the 14th in 2017, Jay gave me the following information. Quote, Jonathan Rogers purchased 80 acres on December the 20th, 1824, from the government, which today is the property owned by, <coughs> by Jay Brown and his wife. The house Jay lives in was begun in 1835 and finished in 1837. <coughs> Going on, Jay says in 1838, the property was sold to Mr. Vernon and Rogers moved to Iowa. 
That's the site of John Rogers' second property, and it is the home of today of Jay and Judy Brown. They are the current owners. Now, to put this in a relationship for you, the arrow with the first in it points to the original tract of land that John Rogers settled on. When he didn't like the boundaries, he moved to this property here. Jonathan Rogers had a brother named Joseph. The home of Joseph Rogers, Jonathan Rogers' twin brother, was located a short distance east of Jonathan's and was begun in 1832 and finished in 1834. It burned in May of 2017. This is John Rogers' second home, and this is his brother Joseph Rogers' home. State Road 38, direction is east. I got some photographs of the home after it had burned, and I was here at the History Center, and I got a call from my friend Jay Brown. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm at the museum. He said, have you got your camera with you? Yeah, I did, just by chance. He said, get down here right away. Why? He says, I don't have time to tell you. Just get down here right away. So I drove down to Jay's house. He was sitting in the driveway, truck running. Hop in, he says. We're going down to Joseph Rogers' house. I said, what's the hurry? He says, when you get there, you'll see. Out of the view of my camera is a bulldozer. And it's getting ready to knock the house down. And he says, we need to get in there. He says, I want you to see it. Plus, he says, there's something in the barn that I want you to see. So I walked around the property, took pictures of it. Obviously, it has been added on to. But I wanted you to see upstairs, and this was kind of a not too safe climb up these stairs to get up here because I wanted you to see the ax marks in the timbers of the original house construction. We went into the barn. Jay said, I want to show you something. You see that? That's the side of a Conestoga wagon that the Rogers family contends that that's what brought them here. We got it out of there. As I could hear the chug, chug, chug of the uh, bulldozer outside, he was ready to knock the thing down. We did get it out of there. And um, I, Jay said, do you want to come up here and see it? And I said, no, I'm not climbing up there, but I'll give you my camera and you can take the pictures. <laughs> Jay's considerably younger than I am. So Jay got up and took pictures of it. And you can see it's in pretty rough shape, but that's the real deal, according to the Rogers family. That was taken down. It's now in the care of a person in uh, Fall Creek Township. Nancy, what's his name? Well, it's now in Southern Indiana, but Jay Brown had it for a while. Okay. There was a McAllister that had it for a yes. while. But now it's in Southern Indiana for? Being restored. Being restored. Okay. And... Um, well, it's not a complete wagon, but it's enough that Pendleton will be able to display it. Yeah. And I think we helped him out with some wagon wheels uh, to, to complete the look. But that's how close. That's how close we came. He, the bulldozer was digging the hole in the lot where all of the, once he knocked the buildings down, that would all go over there and then they'd set it on fire. Just more pictures of that, uh, of the wagon. Pendleton. In 1820, eight men came from Clark County, Ohio, to the falls with the purpose of establishing homes. The county seat of Clark County, Ohio is Springfield. If you're familiar with Ohio, uh, you take... Interstate 70, and you go through Dayton, and the next county is Clark County. Seven of those men were married, William Curtis, Israel Scott, Thomas and William McCartney, Saul Shaw, Manley Richards, and Elias Hollingsworth. The eighth, Moses Corwin, was unmarried. Mrs. Hollingsworth, 
<clears throat> came with her husband and was most likely <clears throat> the first white woman in the county. Their son, E.P. Hollingsworth, was born November the 7th, 1820, and was the first white male child born in the township. And oddly enough, in the evening of that same day, Electa Shaw became the second child and the first white female child born in the township. After choosing lands in several sites surrounding present-day Pendleton and perhaps erecting a very basic shelter, the married men returned to Ohio to bring their families. Manley Richards is the only one to not settle with the original group as early election records show him living in Adams Township. Other settlers soon followed, including Thomas M. Pendleton. Although the exact date of his arrival is unknown, it can be assumed that he arrived before June 3, 1823, because it was on that date when he purchased and recorded his land at the home of William McCartney, land that was to later become a town bearing his name. A large percentage of the first settlers of Fall Creek Township located at or near the falls on Fall Creek, and the density of the population gave the locality the appearance of a town. But Mr. Pendleton was the first to conceive the idea or take steps towards founding one. In 1821, Thomas McCartney erected a crude corn mill to grind grain into meal. Thomas, along with his brother William, also operated a small store. Undoubtedly, all who ventured there to have their grain ground or secure needed goods at the McCartney Brothers store called the place by the name familiar to all as the Falls. When the state legislatures met at Corridon the first Monday of December in 1822, an act was passed granting county pioneers the right to organize a separate jurisdiction for the administration of affairs. County business was done at the home of William McCartney, where the county was formally organized on November the 10th, 1823, so that will be the date we will mark when we do our bicentennial. That's the old state house at Corden. How many of you have been there? That's an interesting place. It's a, it's a day trip, uh, but certainly worth seeing. There are other things around the courthouse square there in Corden, but the old state house is open for people to see. The arrow here points to the site of the William McCartney log cabin. And I've zoomed in a little bit closer. It's pointing to this home right here. The house was constructed of logs situated on a lot later occupied by the Universalist Church. The earliest courthouse in the county was built on the west side of North Main Street in Pendleton. And that's a crude drawing that somebody made of what it looked like. It was the seat of county government in Madison County for four years, 1823 to 1827. In uh, 1923, when Madison County celebrated its centennial, there was a parade here in Anderson, and that was one of the entries in the parade, first courthouse in Madison County. That's the Universalist Church on the site of the William McCartney House, and another view of it. It was erected in 1895, and that's the site again of the courthouse as it is occupied today by the people by the name of Ely. And Bob and his wife, Bob is a member here, and that's their home. Bob tells me the bricks in his home, some of them came from the church when they tore it down. On the 13th day of January, 1830, Thomas Pendleton had the same land which he recorded on June 3rd, 1923, surveyed and divided into town lots thus officially establishing the name of Pendleton, even though it had been commonly called by that name for some time. I've scoured the records, and people were referring to Pendleton as Pendleton long before 1830. In Pendleton is Thomas Pendleton's house, a historical marker outside of it, and there's his home. For 1830s, that's quite a substantial home. It's on South Main Street in uh, Pendleton, about the 200 block, I think, something like this. South Madison Community Foundation occupies the building, and that's their offices then. That's his final resting place in Grove Lawn. 
27 years later, on the 12th day of October, 1850, the original plat was resurveyed and corrected by Colonel Nineveh Berry, at which time two or three additions were made to the original one. And on December 24th, 1853, a vote was taken to determine whether Pendleton should be incorporated as a town or remain a village without any organization. 41 votes were cast, with 37 being in favor of incorporation. One more place name is associated with Pendleton and is reflective of the period when the town was the county seat of Madison County. On May 4, 1824, the United States Post Office officially opened for business there with Moses Cox appointed as the postmaster. The office functioned until it closed on the 31st day of October, 1826, under the name Madison Courthouse. And this is a historical monument or marker outside of the uh, current post office showing you, telling you of that history. And then on the other side, this is kind of interesting, I think. It says, uh, on February 15, 1930, William Kaiser was commissioned by the United States Treasury Department to paint the Logger's Mural, uh, which uh, can, is on the uh, post office today. Uh, there, are, there are people who come to Pendleton just to see that mural. I had a group from Tipton down there one day uh, giving them a history of Pendleton, and uh, their express interest was before they left, we want to go see the mural inside the post office, and there it is. Whenever I enter Pendleton on State Road 38, and I come in this way, I, this sounds trite, but I think I've gone to heaven. It's just so pretty there. It's just so pretty. It's uh, part of the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this plaque uh, denotes the women who were involved in the original formation of the uh, um, Pendleton, uh, uh, historic Pendleton Fall Creek Settlement Organization, and then the designation as uh, being part of the uh, uh, historic register of historic places. The whole town is a historic uh, site. The whole town is. On that plaque, it mentions two famous incidents associated with Pendleton. One is the um, execution of the men who were hung, who killed the Indians uh, out by Markleville, and their subsequent trial and hanging there at Pendleton. And the other is the visit by Frederick Douglass in September of 1843 when he was mobbed. And uh, we'll speak to that here in just a little bit. But it shows you, that tells you that on that marker. And then out on uh, North Pendleton Avenue is uh, this marker to the, uh, the Indian Massacre, um, at least to the execution site. And uh, Bob Post was responsible for something I think quite unique. He brought up a red rock and a white rock. And he told me that these came, the red rock he found near the site where the massacre took place, the white rock, he said, he found near the site where the hanging of the white men took place. Symbolic. This is the, the site that is traditionally accepted as where the hanging took place. No, they didn't hang them from that tree. What makes this significant is that in United States history, in United States history, this was the first time that white men were executed for killing Native Americans. The very first time in United States history that that occurred. Yeah, March of 1824, the massacre occurred. Nine Indians were massacred. And the uh, trial was held in the fall of 24. Uh, the first man was executed in January of 25 and the other two were executed in June of 25. Men, women, and children were all part of those that were massacred. There were nine all total. Supposedly one got away is what common folklore says, and there was to be four executed, but the one who was not executed was the son of one who was executed, and because he was 17 at the time of the massacre, 
and testimony at the trial, he was there, but he did not take direct participation in the killing. And so even the, the jurors passed the decision down to convict. They, along with the townspeople of Pendleton, of which at that time there were 95 people in Pendleton, and 88 of them signed a petition to go to the governor of Indiana to say that boy should not be hung. On the day of the hanging, they'd hung his dad and his dad's uh, brother, his uncle, um, by marriage. Laid him in coffins. Lid's not on the coffins yet, right below where he was to be hung. They take him up on the wagon, the back of the wagon, where he's got the noose around his neck. And all of a sudden, there's a noise coming through what is today Falls Park. Somebody saying, stop, stop, halt the proceedings. Something words to that effect. Nobody recorded it as exactly, but it was something like that. So everybody stopped as this rider approached. <clears throat> The rider got off of his horse, and he says, there's only two people, or there's only two ways that you can be cleared or be uh, exonerated. One is the Almighty, and the other is the governor of Indiana, and I'm the governor. And you may go free. So the petition that the townspeople circulated... <coughs> got to the governor, and he got there in time. I've often thought that'd be a great scene in a movie, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> be a great scene in a movie. At 226 Mill Road in Pendleton for a lot of years was an old log house. It's not original to that location. Accepted thinking is that it came from somewhere up around uh, where I-69 went through the township earlier and it was moved down there. Nobody that I ever found really knew the story behind it. But I found it, and I put it in the paper. Front page of the, or not on the front, front page of Life and Times of the Herald Bulletin. And I, as, and I told a story about it. Well, from that, the good folks in Pendleton have decided to move that over to the park. And it, is, it has been moved. And it's at the north entrance to the park today. When you pull in there, it's on your right. There's a, there's a parking area there, and the reconstruction will be right on the right as you pull in. Greg Goose in, James Gray. I think that is a one neat place. And the Stevenson Building, built in 1860. And this, is a, this is a postcard. You see it a lot in the Pendleton postcards. And I thought, I'm just going to take a modern-day shot of the same postcard. That's the old post office. This is the new post office. Some scenes from Pendleton. I can't say enough nice things about that place, even if she weren't here. <coughs> I'd say nice things about the Pendleton Historical Museum. It's a place well worth your time to go visit. Uh, they're open from uh, May to October, first weekend in May to the last weekend in October. They're open on Saturdays and Sundays from 1 to 5 in the afternoon. They have docents there who will uh, be glad to take you through and show you. There's two floors of great uh, display of South uh, Madison County artifacts, and uh, uh, they don't have everything displayed because they don't, they don't have the room to do that. So every winter... They spend time refurbishing their displays and they have them out. So I suppose they're doing that right now. And Nancy's nodding her head. Nancy is the president of that museum. Their neighbor to the north, Pendleton, Huntsville. A rivalry in the beginning. Located on the north bank of Fall Creek and only a short distance upstream from Pendleton is Huntsville. The town derived its name from one of the first settlers, William Hunt. At one time, it was a flourishing village and was a rival with neighbor Pendleton. Huntsville was laid out May 24, 1830 by uh, Eliezer Hunt and Enos Adamson. Within a few years, a spirit of rivalry with Pendleton began to manifest itself 
with the arrival of the Bell Fountain Railroad in 1850 at Pendleton, the differences were set to rest as both towns had courted the railroad and the prosperity its arrival promised. With the railroad's choice of Pendleton, business in Huntsville declined. Today, <coughs> the old grade of the railroad just south of the historical museum uh, is seen here and the abutments for the original bridge <coughs> that carried the railroad over the Fall Creek chasm. Now that is an interesting story because the railroad was brought from Indianapolis uh, and stopped there in the uh, uh, fall of 1850. And it wasn't until 1851 that the engineers figured out what they were gonna do with that chasm. They had two choices. One was to, to, to build a bridge that would span the entire chasm of Fall Creek Valley. The other was to fill in Fall Creek Valley and just put a small bridge over the creek. Well, that second choice would not have been a good choice because when the creek floods, it would have washed out. So they built the one bridge that went across and there are pictures of it. It was a wooden covered bridge. It was opened in 1851. It was when it was opened the longest covered railroad bridge in, the, in Indiana. And it was June of the following year that the railroad arrived here in Anderson. This is a mill race that tapped into Fall Creek somewhere way upstream and brought water down to the mill and then dumped it back into Fall Creek. And there is a drawing that you can see the old mill that was there at Huntsville. You see Fall Creek and you see the mill race right beside it. That's what operated Amon Mill. In this drawing, you see the old Amon house in Huntsville. That's the house today. Menden. Menden was once a crossroads village situated at the intersection of two county roads three miles south of Huntsville. Menden was the name of one of the early post offices of the county, a name apparently selected by the post office service, and I can't tell you why. There's no reason for the name Menden. It's just the name that the post office selected. It opened for business on September the 11th in 1849. The village probably never aspired to the dignity of a town as the land was never platted or laid off in town lots. There was a general store established there at one time by Thomas Jordan and the village grew up around the store. On April 30th, 1859, the post office ceased operation and Menden's future was sealed. The abandoned district school number 11, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Menden Cemetery, and a few houses constitute all that is left of that old village today. And Menden is clear down here in this corner of Fall Creek Township. Here's Pendleton. There's Menden. And when you look at it on Google Earth, this is the Menden area. This is State Road 9 coming south out of Pendleton on its way to Greenfield. That's the Antioch Methodist Episcopal Church organized at Menden around 1831. They met in a log building, and in 1842, a frame building replaced the log structure, but it collapsed and was replaced by this church in 1868 at a cost of $3,000. This is a historical marker outside of that church. That's the old Fall Creek Township District School number 11. Uh, I have a soft place in my heart for these old one-room schoolhouses. Uh, that one in particular, because uh, it's abandoned, as you can see, and only time will take its toll on that. And it wasn't too many years ago I was told that somebody wanted to buy that and turn it into a home, and the township trustee or whoever had authority over it said, no, we're not going to sell it. And so there it is. That's the Menden Cemetery. It was the burial ground for the congregation. The earliest date in that cemetery is 1833. And this is interesting. John Mingle is listed in the DAR Index of Patriots. He was born in 1758. 
and came to the southern part of Madison County along Lick Creek with his family in the 1820s. He built a homestead near the little settlement of Menden. A historical note also has him titled as a reverend. He died in 1842, or 1842 at the age of 84. And uh, you'll notice this was put up by the Kick the Weena chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. We are very proud of those people in Madison County for all the things they do. In 1844, a United Brethren Church was added to the southwest corner alongside the cemetery, but it's no longer there. Evidently, both churches, as well as area residents, used the cemetery. Spring Valley. Spring Valley is out east of Pendleton, State Road 38. Today's Indiana State Road 38 passes Sioux Fall Creek Township, running nearly parallel to the same route that was once the old Newcastle and Lafayette State Road. And before that, it was an old trail turned wagon road used by many pioneers making their way into the southern part of our county. This happens to be County Road 50 West, which is Main Street coming out of Anderson. This is State Road 38 as it is today, but along this ridge above it was where the old State Road ran. East of Pendleton, the wagon road ran along the high ground on the south side of Spring Valley for several miles and was the route followed until the state road was opened through the valley in the early 1830s. Those who first settled at the falls traveled this route. That's how they got to Pendleton, was on that route. From where their journey began in Clark County, Ohio, it was a short distance to Dayton. There they traveled over a public road that had been cut through the forest to Newcastle, Indiana. From Newcastle to the falls, their course was determined by compass. The trail they blazed would in time become the Newcastle and Lafayette State Road, the second to be established in our county following the general route now followed by Indiana State Road 38. And if you're questioning what was the first road, it would be the Shelbyville-Fort Wayne Road, which you would know today as Indiana Road Highway 9. About a mile and a half east of Pendleton, State Road 38 intersects with County Road 150 West. Clustered around the intersection is an area known to history as Spring Valley. The assumption is that the area was named for the numerous springs present there. The area's population was at one time sufficient to warrant a schoolhouse, one that can still be seen remodeled into a home on the southeast corner. This is the corner of State Road 38 and County Road 150. The schoolhouse I speak of is this one. The original schoolhouse said here. I've got a picture of it, which I'll show you in just a moment. But we'll focus more on that schoolhouse. Again, that's it. You see State Road 38 here. This is actually the back of this house. And this is the house that I told you set across the road. I think it's unusual. I've never seen this happen before. It goes in reverse. Normally, when we would have one schoolhouse replace a second one, the first one would be one story, the second one would be second, two stories. But the reverse occurred there. I don't know why. But the one story is the second one. And it's this house whose front door faces south is the home that I'm going to show you now. This is the back of the house. This is the front of the house. And the reason that this is the front of the house, even though State Road 38 is behind it, is because this was the original entrance to the school because the wagon road passed in front of the house. Spring Valley area was home to many members of the Society of Friends, the Quakers. The original settlers were in this area from the early time as evidenced by some 1853 tombstone dates found in the Fred Cemetery adjacent to the Fall Creek Meeting House. The Meeting House has a long history. In the summer of 1834, a number of members of this society convened at the house of Jonathan and Ann Thomas, where they continued to meet for the next two years. In 1836, they erected a log church. In 1857, the congregation erected a frame meeting house at a cost of $800. That's the meeting house that's still there today. It is listed, or was listed on the National Register of Historic Places 
in 1997. This is the designation uh, that was on the side of the, of the church. I was down there last summer. That's gone. I don't know where it is, but it's gone. And if you remember years ago, this was the old sign that was out by the road. It's gone. This is the meeting house area. You drive back off of State Road 38. To orient you, this is the old schoolhouse that I just told you about at, at County Road 150. So we've just gone west on State Road 38, you know, a couple hundred yards, I guess that is, and back into where the Friends Meeting House is located. That's a close-up of the cemetery. You see the meeting house, and you see the drive around the cemetery. Very picturesque spot. Now let's go down on the ground and I'll show you a little bit closer. That's the sign that you'll find there today. Services are still held there. The road back to it. And we'll just go around the building. Old picture postcard here on the right showing you this view right here. You can see there's been some, some alterations made. In 1843, African-American speaker Frederick Douglass was touring through the western sections of the county giving anti-slavery lectures. On September 16th, Douglass was in Pendleton. A platform was erected in a grove of trees on the north bank just below the falls for him and others to speak. Shortly after beginning to speak, Douglass was threatened by a group of rebel rousers in the crowd, and in the fracas that followed, he was injured. Incidentally, I was contacted uh, by someone from Southern Indiana, a filmmaker, and I think they want to make a film of this story. So we'll stay tuned, see what happens. Uh, one eyewitness account states that Dr. M.G. Walker saved Douglas from a deadly attack by an assailant, swinging a heavy iron bar over Douglas, who by now was down. The doctor threw his weight against the attacker, hurling him away, just as Neil Hardy and Edwin Fussell came to the aid of the fallen orator. Douglas was helped to his feet by much kinder hands and placed in the care of Mr. William Lukens. He was taken by a wagon three miles east to the Spring Valley area at the home of Neil and Elizabeth Hardy, where the family cared for and attended him with a tenderness that Douglas never forgot. Fearing further attacks, the Quaker women of Spring Valley nursed the injured orator while the men guarded their safety. The Hardys were members of the Society of Friends. There was a rumor that night of September 16th that some of the town toughs from Pendleton were going to come out and finish what they'd started. Uh, they never showed. Afterward, Mr. Hardy received a letter from Mr. Douglas thanking him for his kindness. Picture of Frederick Douglass on the right is latter part of his life. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818, so in 1843 he would have been 25 years old. Probably looked more like that portrait than the other at age 25. This is the site, we think, in this same area. This is the marker for the hanging of the men who in the massacre, but it would have been in this site, we think, where the stand was built because they said it was just below the falls on the north bank where his uh, speech was to take place. And there is a, uh, the Indiana Historical Bureau uh, provided uh, or, or uh, manufactured a marker that's put up here, abolitionist mobbed. Uh, there was a nice dedication ceremony for that. I happened to be there. And uh, notice the color of the rock that Bob Post brought in for that. It's black. It is just next to, you can see in the background here, the historical marker for the massacre of the Indians. So they're right there together. These are some of the donors who helped pay for this. And uh, I'm proud to say the Madison County Historical Society uh, provided funds to help build that. The Busby Settlement. The tip of that arrow is where the Busby Settlement was located. Kind of an interesting story about this. A short distance west of County Road 50 West and situated directly on the old wagon road was a community commonly known as the Busby Settlement. Today all that remains is the Busby Cemetery standing silent witness to the vacated hillside 
where once a small settlement stood. If you look closely, you can still make out where the old road once passed directly by the cemetery gate. The cemetery contains 84 graves, 12 of whom are members of the Busby family who settled in that area, we think circa 1825, so very, very early. My arrow points to the Busby settlement. This is County Road 50 West going south. This is State Road 38. And the Busby settlement was here on this ridge and the cemetery is here in this green patch. To get to it, to get to it, we had to drive over, drive up, and ask permission. And then drive over there to it. It's the only way we could get to it. We being my friend Jay Brown and I. He wanted me to see that. Here you can see that grove of trees where the cemetery is located. A far away view, a little bit closer. And there I am on County Road 50 West. You can see why we had to come in from the other direction. But when we came in from the other direction, this is what we saw. Here's the old cemetery gate. <coughs> the location of the gate is a dead giveaway to where the road was. You always place the gate beside the road. And there are those, there are those who claim that if you look closely enough, you see the old ruts of the wagon of the old state road that ran by the Busby Cemetery. Right there. And it goes on out into the field. It ran along the ridge north of State Road 38, or south of State Road 38. The Busby Cemetery itself, well, I'll just show you the pictures you judge for yourself, its condition. On that same hillside once stood a frame one-room schoolhouse known as the Busby School and Church. After the settlement ceased to exist, the church was picked up and moved two miles south on today's County Road 50 West, where it became the forerunner of the Mount Gilead Church Congregation. This is an old photograph that we found uh, labeled the Old Busby School. This would be the schoolhouse here in the background. Some kind of uh, gathering going on that day. Mount Gilead. Mount Gilead is way down here in the southeastern corner of Fall Creek Township, down County Road 50 West. In 1887, the crossroads of County Road 50 West and County Road 1000 South in the township's southeastern corner witnessed the erection of a new church named Mount Gilead United Brethren. One half mile west of County Road 100 West was a one-room schoolhouse named Jacob. Clearly, the population was sufficient to support a church and a school, and the neighborhood soon took the name Mount Gilead, from the Bible meaning Hill of Testimony. No doubt in reference to the slight elevation upon which the church now stands. And there it is. That's Mount Gilead today. I took several pictures around that. Cornerstone says 1887-1920. Again, I think a beautiful spot in our county. County Road 50 West was probably no more than a dirt country lane when it witnessed the move south of the church building. But it also witnessed a move north, far more important to mankind. A number of years ago, the county historians we gather annually in Indianapolis for meetings. And we have a series of speakers all day long who share with us information about Indiana history. Hopefully information we can take back to our counties and utilize. This particular presentation was put on by the recognized authority on the Underground Railroad, 
activity in Indiana. That's how she was introduced to us. She began to speak about Underground Railroad activity in the state of Indiana. She had all kinds of maps she put up with lines on it, avenues, roads, and so forth. And I kept waiting for Madison County. Never put it up. Break time came. <laughs> Come here. Why do you not have Madison County? She said, we have no verified information, verified information, that there was ever any underground activity, underground railroad activity in Madison County. Okay. It went on all around us. To think that it didn't go here on here is pretty ridiculous, I think. But that's what she said. We have no, we believe that it did, but we have no way to prove it. We have nothing to verify it. Well, I wanted to find out. So I got busy. In pre-Civil War times, <clears throat> four farmers, Edward Roberts, Joel Gerritsen, John Boston, and Charles Jacobs, who lived along the lane, cooperated in helping runaway slaves escape along this route via the Underground Railroad. That's documented. Their immediate destination, the Quaker-populated Spring Valley area, where safety and shelter awaited. That was the avenue from Hancock County into Madison County, into Spring Valley, where the Quaker community was located, and that was their destination. It came up that road. All of you may be are familiar with the Levi Coffin House in Fountain City, Indiana, Wayne County. Again, if you haven't been there, <clears throat> don't go tomorrow. But wait till a nice day and go. It is, it is certainly worth the visit. It is a Indiana historic landmark. He was a conductor on the Underground Railroad, as the men I just mentioned were conductors. And that's the road. That's County Road 50 West. We had a book on our shelf here in the library that uh, I got to looking through one day, just thumbing through it, and there it was. It had been recorded in the Pendleton area years ago. Maybe you Pendleton folks are familiar with that. I didn't know about it, but it, is, it was recorded there that this activity occurred by those four men. Pleasant Valley. That sounds like a pleasant place, doesn't it? Pendleton again. Pleasant Valley is on State Road 38, right out where we cross into <coughs> Green Township. About two miles west of Pendleton on State Road 38 crosses County Road 600 West, the township <laughs> line, before descending into a slight valley where it crosses Foster's Branch. This area was once called Pleasant Valley, probably reflective of its appealing appearance, which continues today. At one time, there was a Methodist church by that name located there with a cemetery. Today, only the cemetery remains. The Pleasant Valley Cemetery is located today on the northwest corner of State Road 38 and County Road 625 West. While the Pleasant Valley residents straddle the township line dividing Fall Creek and Green Township, the cemetery is in Green Township. This is a Google Earth map of that uh, shot. Uh, this is State Road 38. This is 600. And then it drops, descends into Pleasant Valley where it crosses uh, Foster's Branch. And this is 625 West and the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. A little bit closer view of it. And down on the ground, you see State Road 38 passing through the intersection of 600 and descending into the valley that was Pleasant Valley, crossing <laughs> Foster's Branch and the cemetery that is located there. Homesteads. Some early photographs, this one of H.T. Bates in Fall Creek Township. This one of um, Ellsbury Scott. How many of you have seen the Williams Homestead? 
Now, what is unusual about that for me is that for years, for years, that said 1823, for years. And last year, change it to 1822. So they, evidently the family has learned something to change the, the date from 1822. Or I'm losing my mind. I don't know which it is. But, but that's the Williams Homestead. You've all passed it probably on the uh, Huntsville Road. And then Indiana's got a unique thing, and not necessarily unique to Indiana, but if you are a Hoosier homestead and the family has, has occupied the ground for 100 years, you get to display one of those. And there's numerous ones of those dotting Madison County today. <coughs> Quite an honor for the farm to stay in the same family for 100 years. Solomon Fussell. He built that log cabin on State Road 38 in 1832, and we have letters <clears throat> that Solomon Fussell wrote uh, back to family in Pennsylvania. We have them in our files here. That was the log home that he built, and it was quite a landmark in the Pendleton area. And then I'm told that somebody came along and decided, well, I'm going to buy that property. I'm going to change it. And so they bought it and tore it down and built this place, built this in its place. Now the one they built is a look-alike, but it's not the same thing. I love old schoolhouses. This is the uh, Burdett Schoolhouse, uh, built in 1898. It's on County Road 575 West and County Road 600 South, real close to Maple Ridge Elementary School where our granddaughters attend. Last remaining Ford is in Madison County. It's the Lick Creek Ford at County Road 950 South, also known as the Myers Ford. And there you are. Yes, you have to go through water, just as our pioneer ancestors did years ago. Fall Creek Township honors its past. Outside of uh, the Pendleton Historical Museum is this plaque put up by the Pendleton Lions Club in 1966. Uh, near this spot, the first white child was born in Madison County, 1820. The first marriage took place in 1821. First courthouse and jail erected in 1823. Three men tried and hanged here in 1825 were first whites ever executed in Indiana for killing Indians. Woolen, flour, and sawmills erected here in 1825. Uh, Fred Douglas was uh, assaulted by a mob in 1843 for speaking in favor of the abolition of slavery. Stone was taken from these quarries um, for culverts on the National Road. Lumber was sawed here for the first courthouse in Indianapolis. Pendleton Incorporated in 1854. Falls Park acquired the town of Pendleton in 1920. Um, this courthouse in Indianapolis, the wood was sawed in Pendleton, but then they had to get it to Indianapolis. There was no road to take it. Fall Creek was not really navigable to float all the logs. So they took all the logs up to Perkinsville, to White River, loaded them on canal boats, and floated them down the White River to Indianapolis. In Falls Park is this rather um, unique piece of uh, gunnery. It's called Whistling Dick. In the park, too, is this is something a lot of people don't see. This is the Grand Army of the Republic um, Memorial, uh, the um, uh, Major Henry Post in Pendleton. Grand Army of the Republic uh, was responsible for uh, putting, laying that out. Um, Civil War veterans. And of course, a very, very nice memorial there in the park to men who served and gave their all from Fall Creek Township. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>